Hey everyone, I'm Andrew and I made the Kessel Run in 13 parsecs. Pretty impressive, but I still can't touch the record held by the fastest hunk of junk in the galaxy, the Millennium Falcon. Chewing. We're home. The custom Corellian cruiser is going to be front and center in Solo, a Star Wars story, but before the movie pulls back the curtain on this fantastic freighter, we wanted to take a look at the design, functionality, and influence of one of the most iconic ships in science fiction. This is why we love the Millennium Falcon. Before anything else, it just looks so cool. Despite everyone, and I mean everyone, in Star Wars constantly taking a massive space shit on it. What a piece of junk. This bucket of bolts is never gonna get past that blockade. Just blow that piece of junk out of the sky! Nothing touches the Falcon's timeless design. In early scripts, the Falcon was simply referred to as the pirate ship, and Lucas's rough sketches looked a lot more traditional. It had big rockets in the back, a cockpit in the front, and a long cylindrical body. He handed off his idea to Ralph McQuarrie and the team at ILM, who fleshed it out through further sketches, storyboards, and models until they landed on the final design. Then, after months and months of hard work and endless iterations, George Lucas makes a last minute call and ditches everything, and the whole team starts over from scratch. Uh, yes. Turns out, a TV show called Space 1999 started airing in the interim, and it featured a ship called the Eagle that looked a little too close for comfort. This is also where the name Millennium Falcon came from. 1999, one more year, Millennium, Eagle, Falcon, Millennium, Falcon. George Lucas is a fucking genius. It's not that Lucas was worried about plagiarism, he just wanted his movie's most important ship to have a distinct aesthetic. It needed character and personality to match the cocky scoundrel behind the wheel. So after spending a third of their budget on the seven foot long pirate ship model, ILM went back to the drawing board. There's a long standing urban legend that the Falcon's shape was inspired by a half eaten hamburger. Make the ship kind of like a hamburger, you know, the bun and oh, sorry, the meat in the middle. ILM's Joe Johnston had only four weeks to design, sculpt, and build the spaceship, which is why there aren't too many surviving sketches or drawings, just because there simply wasn't enough time. They kept the radar dish, gun batteries, and WW2-inspired cockpit from the pirate ship and slapped them on a new body made from bashed together parts from Ferrari and tank model kits. If only they had Gundams back then, we would have had a totally different spaceship. The crew lovingly called it the Pork Burger, but they eventually settled on a new name that, unlike Luke and Ben, you've probably heard of. You've never heard of the Millennium Falcon? Should I have? As for their original model, some minor alterations transformed the puny pirate ship into the bulky blockade runner from the opening scene. The Tantiv IV was way too slow to outrun the Imperials, but the Falcon is all about function. The YT-1300 freighter first rolled off the assembly line a long time ago. A long, long time ago. Eh, somewhere else. Nearly 100 years before the Battle of Yavin, in fact. You can spot it flying around in the prequels. If you squint hard enough, it's kind of tough to see. Enhance, 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 enhance. But the original builders would have also probably had a hard time recognizing their product too. That's because the Falcon has passed through countless hands over the decades, with each captain modifying the ship to suit their own needs and reflect their personality. When we first meet the ship in Solo, it's in the debonair hands of Lando Calrissian, and in this case, you can absolutely judge a book by its cover, or a ship by its hull. The Falcon is decked out in this awesome white and blue paint job, a sleek profile that actually resembles early Ralph McQuarrie paintings and a mysterious new section that fills the gap between its headlights. Of course, it's what's on the inside that counts, and as you'd expect from the coolest motherfucker in the galaxy, Lando turned the Falcon's interior into the ultimate interstellar party spot. It's got a kitchen, it's got a wet bar, a top of the line sound system, probably has an Amazon Echo in that motherfucker, a classic Dedrick table, and of course, a cape for every occasion. I got an everyday cape, sister's wedding cape, intergalactic president's day cape. This is just if someone gets cold. Okay. Dr. Strange, take note. Stop. He basically took a semi-truck and turned it into the shaggin' wagon. I mean, that bed definitely didn't fit two people in the original trilogy, which leads me to ask the question, where did Chewie sleep? 
<laughs> when are you gonna take the couch? I want the bed. Lando has always been more of a schmoozer than a smuggler after all, but the Falcon's next captain didn't care much about appearances. For the scruffy looking Han Solo, it was all about speed. Push it! In order to smuggle contraband around the galaxy, he tricked out his ride with some extremely illegal modifications. I don't know where this ship came from, but it is not within the set parameters for a civilian transport. Once Han won the ship, he replaced the engines with an overclocked new hyperdrive, salvaged armor and gun emplacements from Imperial destroyers, and stuffed it full of secret compartments and hideaway blaster cannons. The result is a vessel with the speed and maneuverability of a small attack fighter, but with the shields and firepower of a slow-moving dreadnought. Now, all those alterations come at a cost. The Falcon's engines are second to none, but they're also less reliable than in-flight Wi-Fi. And it certainly isn't much to look at either, but the ugliness is actually kind of a feature. You're nothing. You're braver than I thought. Nice, come on. I mean, think about it. If you're an Imperial officer on the lookout for the fastest smuggling ship ever made, you're probably gonna let a flying trash heap slide right under the radar. What about that ship? That was garbage! The garbage will do! There's some real-world reasoning behind the Falcon's foul appearance, too. George Lucas has a well-documented obsession with hot rods. It's basically what launched his career with American Graffiti. And within the hot rod scene, there's a subgenre called rat rods, stripped down raw vehicles that were intentionally designed to be as ugly as they were powerful, just like the Falcon. What a piece of junk. The Falcon may look like shit, but as Han says, you got it where it counts, kid. Not everyone in the Star Wars galaxy appreciates the Falcon, but in our galaxy, it's had a massive influence. We've talked about hamburgers and hyperdrives already, and if you ask me, we don't talk enough about them. But when you boil everything else away, the Falcon is pretty much just a flying saucer. It's a classic, cheesy sci-fi concept with a fresh coat of paint. And by that, I mean layers and layers of dirt and grime. Before Star Wars, we mostly thought of sci-fi spaceships as shiny chrome rockets from serials like Flash Gordon. They're impressive in a showroom car kind of way, but they didn't look or feel like things people actually drove. The Falcon, on the other hand, is ugly and weathered and aged. It's like the used car of sci-fi and everyone's owned a used car. I think that's kind of why people love it so much. It's not the pristine Enterprise or the sterile Discovery. It's a broken down bucket of bolts, but it's our bucket of bolts. You can see the authenticity in every oil stain and blaster scar, and it tells you a lot more about the characters behind the wheel. The huge future aesthetic had a massive impact on science fiction. From the filthy space truckers of Alien to Blade Runner's grimy future LA. But none of that would have been possible without Star Wars, the Falcon, and her crew. Every kid, including me, wanted to be Han Solo. And more than that, we wanted to fly his ship. The closest we could probably get are the toys, like the pioneering Kenner playset from 1979. Now, this bad boy ran for $30 in the 70s, well over 100 today, which is nothing compared to the $800, 7,500-piece Lego kit that was released last year. But still, no matter which toy you had, or books you read, or games you played, Star Wars and its flagship Falcon had a huge impact on the generation of creators who grew up loving them. From fictional vessels like Jaws Wheaton's Serenity to real-world spacecraft like Elon Musk's Falcon rockets, which are named in honor of Han's flying heap. In the Star Wars galaxy, the Millennium Falcon is nearly a century old, but its legacy in the real world could last even longer. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you're looking for more Star Wars content, our friends over at Seeker just launched a podcast called Bad Science. Each week they separate science from fiction in some of our favorite films, and for their very first episode, they broke down The Empire Strikes Back with an actual NASA engineer. Check out our link in the description. As always, please subscribe to Now This Nerd, and if you see Han, tell him that I know he shot first.